We have two items on the agenda uh, that we'll get to very shortly. So uh, the the only thing I, I says here, welcome and chair's remarks. Uh, my remarks are that, again, I'm so happy to be in this building. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful. This is a fabulous, fabulous space. And I really uh, thank uh, Waterfront Toronto for uh, making this move. Um, oh, yeah. And I have to say in the public session, I'm going to say it. Today's David Crombie's 88th birthday. <laughs> so I want it to be officially recorded because uh, a special guy. Okay. Uh, approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to read them? Comprehensive as ever. Are there any amendments, changes, questions, comments? No? We have a motion and a seconder then to approve them? David and Eric? Okay. Thank you. Um, Today's agenda, any conflict interest, con or declaration of conflicts of interest, I'm sorry, from anyone present or online? No? Seeing none? We're good. Okay, just two items. Uh, Villiers Island Precinct proposed amendments, very preliminary draft, which uh, you'll uh, uh, hear uh, what's really before us is, is, is simply the, the massing and the zoning. Um, and Chris will elaborate on what's not here yet and what's to come. Um, and then we'll have a slight adjournment at 3.05. And then, of course, we'll be back in, in camera at 3.30, probably till 5 o'clock, and then conclude. Um, so update from last month. Does Leon or Chris have a presentation? Go ahead, Leon. Yes. Um, Paul, would you like to? Um, oh, there it is. I was looking for it. Yeah. I'm more than happy to read this waterfront. Toronto acknowledges that the land upon which we are undertaking our revitalization efforts is part of the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit of First Nation. And Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit of First Nation. In addition, Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that Toronto has historically been a gathering place for many Indigenous peoples, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home to many First Nations. Native peoples today. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Okay, Leon. Yep. Um, so you, you've already summarized the agenda for today. Uh, I'll start with the report back on last month's project. So last month we saw McCleary District Precinct Plan. Um, the team is is continuing to work on the massing, the building typology, and the various public realm options that you saw last month. Um, they're beginning stakeholder engagement and will continue through June. Um, the project is scheduled to return to us uh, for stage two review in June. Also, we saw Basin Media Hub. Um, so this one, they, they completed their third review last month. This was detailed design, so we won't be seeing them come back to the panel. Uh, they are continuing to uh, refine the design. Um, they're looking at art integration opportunities. Um, they want to refine some of the entrance gateway designs. They are also looking at providing more buffer at the Carlo Street, uh, Carlo Avenue terminus. Um, and responding to one of the panel's comments, they're working with uh, city planning and urban forestry to resolve uh, plant species. Um, and uh, we will report back when we have an update on the design. And a couple of slides on uh, Waterfront Toronto construction updates. <coughs> so right next to us, Queen's Key East Lake Fill continues. Um, TRCA completed their fishing operation and they found no fish. <laughs> <laughs> so dredging has commenced. <laughs> Um, yeah, not not really a big surprise that there's no fish. Um, Actually, it is a bit of a surprise. I'm right? surprised. Yeah. No, I yeah. Fish there. I mean, I'm not surprised there wouldn't be a lot, but I'm mm -hmm. kind of amazed they didn't find Zero. any fish. Yeah. Any fish. <laughs> they escaped before. <laughs> um, so what you see in this photo is um, the dredging uh, happening. Um, so they have to take all of the debris out. Uh, what you see in the back of the photo there, um, they start to lay out the, the dredged debris on land. There's a liner that separates it from the ground, so none of the contamination 
will seep through uh, into the soil. The, they're going to drain it, dry it, and then move it off site. Um, anything interesting? Heard. I can ask. Um, PLFP, so um, the, the project continues to advance there. Here you're seeing uh, the stonework in Promontory Park South with the outlines of Canoe Cove really taking shape. And over in the nature play area, River Park North. Mm -hmm. Um, that work has progressed well over the winter. The Shot Creek work will begin next week on the Badlands. Um, the Snowy Owl and the Reaching Raccoon will be installed within the next month. And here you can see more detailed and a close shot of the Badlands. Let so, Emily speak to this because this is her baby. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's been really interesting working with BCC to do a great job. All of the homework for the shot tree, which um, that's that right here. So it's starting to show the, the kind of contouring of what the Badlands are going to look like. Starting next week, we're going to be up here in the shot tree area. With the color, that's going to be <laughs> very exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and looking ahead, so next month we only have one project on the agenda, and um, we will see we will see what happens with that with that item, uh, West Island's Block Thirteen, for June. We have, Which block is that? Just refresh your memory. So the last one, Block Thirteen, is west of Corktown. Um, it is the last sort of trapezoidal shaped block. We we've seen them once. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, I think it's taken them some time to, to come back. Um, and then we have we have W uh, <coughs> LRT um, potentially returning in June for both Queens Key Extension and also Young Slip. And we also have um, Waterfront Toronto Accessibility Framework. So that's that's also gearing up to come as well. I think that's it, Paul. So. Hey. Uh, anything you want to add, Chris? Otherwise, we're ahead of schedule. Are we? Yeah. Well, Paul, do you want to just mention in camera, as for our records, that this is we're being not, recorded? We're not, sorry, we're in, in the public session, that this is being recorded and oh, I said photographer. It. Oh, you said it already. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we reconvene. Uh, in the forest is Villiers Island Precinct proposed amendments preliminary draft plan only and um i am reminded the people who this is a long room so you got to speak up here because they can't hear you back there so whenever you ask questions or comments project otherwise uh you know we're in trouble okay so introduction anthony uh project manager community planning city of toronto all yours oh, thank you very much and it is a pleasure to present today, um, but essentially is two and a half years worth of work. Um, so today we're going to be discussing the 2024 Villiers Demonstration Plan, which was a result of a massing study to increase density on Williams Island. And this will be enabled by uh, official plan amendments as well as a rezoning, but also an update to the 2017 Builders Island Precinct Plan. And we'll be discussing key urban design considerations as well as identifying a series of next steps. So I'll just provide a very brief. Excuse me, take. Anthony, could, we can't hear you at all. Sorry. I will try and enunciate. I am used to a microphone. Amplify things. Thanks, Joe. You want, uh, you want to come closer, Joe? Uh, there's a whole bunch of us here. You right. Know that. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right. Thanks. Yeah. Please remind us if you can't hear. Yes. So. I am. I have a soft voice. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he carries a big stick. Hey, Joe. Dig in. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bang in. <laughs> so today I'll be introducing the precinct plan amendment as well as the the zoning approach that we're going to be taking as an outcome of the massive study that was, was 
completed and the demonstration plan that has been recommended from that work. Um, I'll also be overviewing what we heard from the last DRP and uh, Pina is to provide public realm context unless Pina is not available. I'm going to do it. Thank you. And um, then Ray will be providing an overview of density and massing updates. And I'll just provide a brief overview of the next steps. So this project was initiated in October 2021 with a consultant-led uh, exploration of various approaches to increase density on Villiers Island while retaining the basic structure, uh, the streets and blocks pattern, and the overall approach to public realm. Uh, that was identified and recommended through the 2017 Village Island Precinct Plan that was adopted by City Council. In, since 2021, we have undertaken two rounds of public consultation, presented in 2023 some options for increasing density to this panel, and uh, as well as done a great deal of iterative work. Um, between the city, Waterfront Toronto, and CREATIO to arrive at a 60% density increase above 2017 levels. So, this actually person, how did this process begin? So, when the Villiers Island Precinct Plan was adopted, as well as the Villiers, as well as the Department of Planning Framework, in 2017, we were directed by Council to look at approaches to increase the overall quantum of affordable housing on affordable housing um, on Gilders Island, as well as within the port. And there had been a number of decisions that were made based upon um, our current housing situation to look at ways of increasing density overall on the island and optimize the overall approach that we're taking to providing affordable housing. We also had a series of development applications on private lands that, um, that had aspirations of 40 to 50% increases in density over what was expected in 2017. All of all of this work has, um, has recommended a new vision for the island, which was going to be incorporated into the official plan modification uh, that we're bringing forward. And that is that Villiers Island will set a precedent for the next generation, for a next generation climate positive, resilient, inclusive model of development for Toronto. The overall character of Villiers Island will be inclusive, sustainable, and walkable, dense urban community with the diversity of uses and building technologies. So when we were undertaking this work, there was a density study scope of work that was agreed upon. And that was that we were going to be focusing on the public lands only, not the private lands, that uh, the density of development on public lands was going to be reviewed and we we're going to look at opportunities <coughs> to optimize that density. For massing and build for approaches, as well as identify impacts, increased densities on Keating Channel, which at this at the time of 2017 was going to be retained as low rise. And the percentage of affordable housing was to be increased overall and looking at opportunities to increase increase that whole GFA that was devoted to especially affordable rental housing and confirm the quantum of and location of office and retail GFA. We were not directed to explore um, alternate streets and blocks patterns, uh, urban structure, or the the uh, the overall approach to public realm, but build upon a very robust frame. And the rationale for that was because there had been an incredible amount of work that had been undertaken through Portland's acceleration initiative through Villiers Island precinct planning and the Portland's planning framework, as well as the supporting environmental assessments. Um, and we had done a great deal of work for through Portland's flood protection and enabling infrastructure 
uh, on the public realm, uh, a good portion of the public realm, the major street network, which has now been partially constructed as well in an interim condition, as well as the river valley. There was a number of due diligence uh, studies that were undertaken as we were moving through finalizing the approach to uh, build form and the increase in density that was exploring transportation and network, tra network and transit capacity, community facilities and services calibration for the new population, impacts on the surrounding parkland and a review of local park requirements, achieving sustainability and climate positive outcomes with an increased population, land use compatibility with Portland industries, uh, an affordable housing approach, enabling infrastructure and servicing capacities as well was confirmed, approaches to solar access and wind mitigation to ensure that we had a pedestrian, uh, a pedestrian microclimate uh, that was very, very favorable, as well as positive outcomes from the public realm, OPM conformance, and of course, exploring uh, Billy Bishop Air Sports Space Controls in relation to uh, build form. So the study outcomes uh, were that we were able to increase affordable housing from the minimum 20% to a target of 30% of GFA throughout the entire island, um, with the exception, of course, of the private lands, uh, and gross floor area increase of approximately 60% over 2017 levels. And we will go into the uh, how that's been deployed. Introduction of a new public library, which is actually a very positive attribute, and a dramatic increase within the community infrastructure <coughs> throughout the island. We've confirmed the infrastructure and servicing approach for the island uh, is appropriate, and as well as confirming the transportation impacts have been minimized. And um, we've identified the next phase of work which is to establish a permanent name on the island and to develop a, what we're calling at this point an indigenous cultural interpretive plan. And we're updating the streets, open space and public <clears throat> realm planned in response to the built form and our indigenous engagement, which is forthcoming. So the Villiers Island zoning approach overall is what we call the spinning shirt approach, which attempts to maximize the amount of flexibility that you can provide within a tool such as zoning to allow for a number of possible outcomes. And what this zoning approach does is it articulates the general build form goals to the island and it permits a very broad uh, variety of uses. Um, also, we focused on allowing for early activation and uh, what we're calling meanwhile uses, which are transitional uses over the 25 year development horizon of this plan. We want to make certain that this is the zoning is future proofed and um, allows for the evolution of city priorities over time, as well as policies and guidelines and allows room for architectural expression and the uh, evolving creative design solutions that we may see uh, through series a series of development phases. So I'm not going to get into the approach, but uh, I'm actually very proud of, of the approach that's been taken and it, it definitely will ensure that we're able to we're able to accommodate a number of different outcomes. For future work within the the project timeline. Um, after this meeting, we're going to be moving forward with finalizing the official plan policies, the zoning, as well as any amendments to the Villiers Island uh, precinct plan and report to planning and housing committee in June. But we're following up in 2024 with finalizing Villiers Island business implementation plan with the draft plan of subdivision, as well as initiating the second phase of Billiers Island Precinct Plan amendments, which will be focused on the public realm and our outcomes of our Indigenous engagement. We also are going through a renaming exercise for the island with Mississaugas of Credit and with our urban Indigenous communities. And we're planning on commencing 
the request for proposal process for the first develop first development blocks in 2025. Just a very brief overview of what we presented to the, the design review panel in in 2003, and that was three options. They were not mutually exclusive options, just different ways of deploying density. And the first option did look at the northern blocks and Keating Channel. The second option, increasing density, focused on the eastern portion. And then we looked at also focusing density on the central portion of the island. And that resulted in approximately a 40 to a 60% density increase over 20, uh, 2017. And so from that, from that presentation, overall what we heard from the panel was that there was support for at least a 60% density increase on the island. And that you were looking for more public realm in information and details as context for this density increase. Um, also, we were looking, you requested more information on ground floor animation and public spaces, as well as how transit capacity could accommodate the population. And uh, additional information on north south sections from the city to Village Island. Specifically to height and massing, um, there was an increase in the height of buildings along commissioners that some panel members thought was very appropriate, especially framing that new park space. Um, also to, for us to explore new build form typologies that can introduce greater <coughs> velocity within, within the development blocks, which are quite large. Um, a finer block pattern was something that was desirable. Uh, and as well as ensuring that heritage buildings did not dominate actually um, the conversation regarding the deployment of density. And that we should be looking at, instead of sight lines, integrating the buildings, the heritage buildings within, within a very robust um, public realm also to explore other typologies outside of tower and podium and to provide more clarification on airport flight paths, height limitations, and how it impacts density allocation. And everybody can still hear me, correct? Okay. Like I said, very soft voice. <clears throat> in relation to public realm and sustainability, um, many comments were focused on Keating Channel, which is a unique public realm opportunity. And that was, the, some panel members thought that density should not be concentrated on along uh, the Keating Channel, while other members believed that it was critical that we increase density to activate that public realm, which is two-sided and it is shared with the Keating Channel East Precinct. Um, also, we were asked to uh, consider putting dining closer or other activities closer to the Keating Channel and to provide also opportunities for water activation. Uh, built form should focus on controlling climate and respond to sunlight, and we should be leveraging the public realm to create unique microclimates. And we were providing more information on the various massing options on sustainability performance, which is one reason that we do have support from. <clears throat> and we were to ensure that whatever build form solution we brought forward supports a zero carbon neighborhood and minimizes the certain amount, minimizes the embodied carbon emissions. So I'll get to the areas for panel consideration after Chris has an overview of the public realm. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so I, I just want to try to frame this for everybody. So we're actually not reviewing the public realm today. I want to emphasize that we haven't actually designed the public realm yet. So we're doing uh, with this precinct what we've done with our previous ones, like the West Onlands and the East Bayfront, where we do the master plan, we set out street pattern, block pattern, densities, 
built form controls, uh, and then we design the, the, the actual streetscapes and public spaces um, that are around those um, them afterwards. So we have not even hired a design team for this public realm yet. Um, what we do have are some uh, cross sections that show the intention of how we intend to use the different rights of way for the various modes of, of transportation and for placemaking. So I just want to provide that as context, but what we're really here to talk about today, I think more uh, is the buildings themselves, the, the massings, the setbacks, the stepbacks, the heights, the built form controls, certainly how those might impact the public realm. Is that something we've talked about a lot uh, as a team? Um, but the specific designs are really yet to come and they will come to the design review panel um, once we start advancing them. Uh, we don't even have funding to really design those, those streets yet, uh, but uh, that's something we hope to get soon and then those will be, be coming forward. So I do just want to walk you conceptually through where we are. Can I have the next slide, please, Rin? Um, that's the overall totality of this. And I think everyone knows that the Portland's Flood Protection Project is part of Villiers Island. This is really all one project. Uh, the Villiers Island development is not a separate project from Portland's Flood Protection in the sense that we're flood protecting and building a huge park system to support this neighborhood as well as to support flood protection. Next slide, please. Um, there are public realm elements that are not streetscape that remain to be done. Portland's flood protection did not do everything that is intended for the island. So Promontory Park North, which is on the left, uh, is notionally intended to have a skating loop, uh, plantings, uh, and be a flexible park space for a certain amount of events. There's then the Keating Channel Promenade, which runs along the south side of the channel or the north side of the island um, and connects up to Villiers Park, which is intended to be the active recreation park. Um, and again, the diagrams you're seeing here are notional that we did uh, for the sake of costing to develop a high level a sense of what funding we would need in order to build these parks. These are not the designs that are uh, going to be implemented but they have helped us determine a budget or at least a uh, order of magnitude requirement to deliver this public realm. Um, and as I said, once we have funding for design, we will actually start designing these spaces. Um, next slide, please. Uh, then there are the streets uh, and all of the streets in pink here, almost all uh, have yet to be designed as well. So the whole street network, um, two of them have been designed and that is uh, A and B which is New Cherry Street uh, and Commissioner Street. Um, and they in fact have been uh, built to some extent though they are not complete. Um, so those two are a little less flexible uh, than the others where uh, the designs really have yet to come forward. Next slide, please. Um, but the planning for this is really uh, conceived of a hierarchy of streets on the island. So the dark blue streets are the multimodal transit streets. So they will all have um, streetcar service as well as vehicular lanes, as well as sidewalks uh, and green infrastructure. Um, the one to the right, New Munitions, um, does not have streetcar running the whole length of it, but it does have the uh, turnaround loop uh, for the streetcar. So it has to accommodate a uh, streetcar track. So those are kind of the primary streets. They are also the ones that connect uh, much of the rest of the Portlands back to the city. So they're pretty primary. Uh, arteries for um, keeping the film studio district connected and the future communities um, south of the ship channel connected to the city. But, or actually, no, I, you know what? Um, sorry, I'll finish with this one. Then we have the ones in orange, um, which are really the, or sorry, the light blue, which are the local streets. Uh, and that's really conceived of kind of as this loop around the island. Um, those are a smaller scale. They don't have transit. Uh, they are narrower for the most part. Uh, one that is a little wider is Villiers Street, and that was really a decision based around originally trying to preserve some of the industrial heritage. There's a series of train tracks there, uh, which at one time were thought of as something we might want to incorporate in that public space. I think we've moved away from that, so there may be opportunities to reduce the scale of that uh, particular uh, corridor to, to maybe more closely match the other local streets around it. 
Um, we then have uh, pedestrian priority street, which is uh, center street, um, really meant to mostly be about pedestrians, kind of like our wood earths that we've built in the West Donlands. And then we do have um, the non-vehicular uh, street, which is a portion of Old Sherry. So there really is a hierarchy. What I want to do is just quickly show you one example of each of these typologies and what we're thinking about them. So the multimodal streets and transit ways, if you move to the next slide, please, Ray. Um, on the top is what's been built to date for Commissioner Street. It is a 40 meter right of way, which is a, uh, a somewhat wide uh, right of way, uh, but it has um, only 6.6 .6 meters of uh, car travel lanes. It's a two way street. Uh, there are um, some parking. No, actually, I don't think there are too many parking lanes here. Uh, there are turning lanes at the intersections, which are an additional 3.2 meters. So most of this right of way is actually not for cars. Uh, the, probably the biggest piece of it is for the transit right of way, which you can see to the right of where the cars are. That is being built as a meadow today because we're not ready to implement the transit. Uh, so that meadow will be planted and maintained um, until such time as there's funding to bring the transit in or if we are able to do some sort of interim BRT service, which may or may not happen. We've also got um, pretty extensive areas for plantings, wide planting uh, zones that will help uh, treat stormwater. And also we hope provide sufficient growing medium for really healthy trees to emerge here. Um, if you look at the design below, you can see where the trees will be installed. Uh, some of these trees are gonna be installed shortly um, but the ones closer to the transit right of way, uh, which are actually meant to be the columnar oaks, which reflect the historic uh, planting that was here on this street, uh, sort of pre-industrialization. Uh, those we won't plant until the TTC is in, otherwise they would probably be uh, destroyed. And so I just, I think it's worth noting that only about 17% of this cross section is really for cars. 34% um, of this cross section is for plantings, which is the single largest piece of this and we anticipate um, a very robust um, series of plants and hopefully a very interesting plant palette that will go in there that will make this really a greenway. Um, so that's commissioners. That's how we've used or proposed to use this, this right of way. Again, this is not a design really. This is, well, I guess it kind of is, but we haven't finished building it. Um, but this is essentially how it lays out and it will get finished over time. Next slide, please. So go to the next one, Ray. So the local streets, uh, this is Foundry Street. This is a 20 meter right of way. Again, 6.6 .6 meters of, of car lanes. Uh, the rest of this right of way uh, is dedicated to uh, wide sidewalks. Um, again, a planting uh, area and um, fire access as well as off street parking. Um, this street has not been designed yet, so there is still some uh, flexibility uh, in terms of, you know, exactly how this all gets uh, deployed. I think the goal is to design this again as a uh, as a very green um, corridor uh, with a minimal amount of vehicular traffic, so two lanes, much narrower than that from a car perspective. Next slide, please. Um, pedestrian priority is Center Street. So here we're proposing just one vehicular lane, uh, one uh, bike lane, dedicated bike lane. Uh, again, a pretty generous um, planted buffer, uh, which again is the largest percentage of the width of the right of way. If you take the two planted areas together, um, these are going to be designed as part of a stormwater treatment system. Uh, again, um, and uh, generous sidewalks. And in this case, the sidewalks are really the majority of the uh, of the right of way. Next slide, please. And then the non vehicular. Oh, actually, just go back to Cherry Center for one second. Um, this is actually being designed so that in the fullness of time, we could actually remove the vehicle. So it's being designed to work as a kind of pedestrian only street. Um, if we get to a point where we don't need cars here, they could be very easily closed off and it would make a, a very pure pedestrian environment and become that kind of pedestrian only spine. Next slide, please. And then the next one, non-vehicular. So this is Old Cherry Street. Uh, this is only having uh, emergency access provided in it. Uh, there will not be cars here. Um, we do need the fire route. Um, uh, 
again, pretty extensive plantings on either side to try to keep the trees healthy and to try to help uh, deal with stormwater uh, treatment and very wide sidewalks. So about 50% of this 19 meter right of way um, is, uh, is pedestrian only. So this is the intention behind the, the streetscape system in Villiers, but none of this is actually designed yet. As I said, uh, there's a rendering, thank you, Ray, of, uh, of that portion of Old Cherry. Um, so we think that this is actually a pretty good framework in which to do a public realm. And I've added this slide here. Um, I, I know people get nervous about wide rights of way, but this is just an example to show that it really has more to do with how you use the right of way than how wide the right of way is. So the Ramblas in Barcelona is a wonderful pedestrian street. Most urbanists love it, point to it as a great example. It does have two lanes of cars. It's 90 feet wide and it has a fabulous uh, central uh, esplanade. Avenue of the Americas in New York City, same width, but it's lots of cars, no bike lanes. Um, very intensely paved. Um, so they're very different experiences, but it's really not about how wide the right of way is. Um, and neither of these streets provides for transit, dedicated bike lanes, uh, or any of the other active mobility that I think we all really want to deliver uh, on Villiers Island. So that is the context. I am hoping we don't actually talk about this very much today because I really want to talk about this when we have actual design proposals to bring forward uh, and then we can get into a design. I think what we want to talk about is how the massing starts to impact uh, this public realm and what we think of the overall massing from an architectural uh, freedom point of view. So that's that's it for me. OK, thanks, uh, Chris. Um, so keep moving along. Um, Ray, I believe, make a presentation. Yeah, just before that, I think Anthony's going okay. oh, uh, to the... speak to the panel. Yeah, just a very brief overview of um, areas for panel consideration today. So does the proposed approach to increase density A, maintain the guiding principles of the 2017 failures out and precinct plan? Achieve an appropriate uh, distribution of the increased density to support additional housing. Adequately achieve solar access on key public ground spaces. Allow for good porosity at grade to support a fine grade pedestrian realm. Does the approach to zoning provide adequate flexibility to allow for architectural innovation while ensuring key built form principles? and public realm performance targets are achieved? And how can the future public realm design work respond to the updated massing? And how can the built form be further articulated through urban design guidelines to enhance adjacent public spaces? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Thanks. I you to speak up. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Ray Tisaka, uh, and I'm with Waterfront Toronto Planning and Design. And I'll be walking through the density and massing updates on behalf of city planning, city urban design, Creative, and Waterfront Toronto. Um, so, as shown previously, um, I think we showed this at our last DRP, but by context, uh, this is a current snapshot of the waterfront. Uh, east of Young Street, um, with the planned development massing shown in the orange, uh, and the future waterfront transit line that you see across Queen's Key um, coming down um, New Cherry and across commissioners in yellow. Um, these include sites that are under construction, uh, sites that have active development applications, uh, such as Keyside, sites that are in conceptual stage, uh, or currently undergoing precinct planning, uh, such as McCleary Precinct, as well sites that will go under precinct planning uh, in the future, such as Keating East uh, and South River Wilson Key Districts. As a recap from last ERP, Anthony uh, touched upon it. The left shows the three approaches we examined to increase density on the island by 60% compared to the 2017 plan, and the right shows our final approach. In summary, we increased island-wide density by densifying the western blocks with a height peak along New Cherry Street corridor and gateway where the future LRT line and stop will be. And by also 
densifying to some extent the box along Keating Channel Promenade and the central box, and also increasing heights of the base buildings, um, notably the southern blocks. Uh, more precisely, uh, this shows in 3D the, the pink area, which is the floor space uh, area that has increased as compared to the 2017 Villiers Island plan, which you see in the opaque uh, white massing. Uh, regarding statistics, uh, the 2017 plan to the left uh, yielded approximately 500,000 square meters of GFA, uh, which translates to about uh, 5.0 FSI and about 5,000 units. Uh, the 2024 plan to the right um, yields approximately 800,000 square meters with an FSI of 7.7, .7, which is approximately uh, 9,000 units. Um, just to note that the unit numbers are still estimates based on uh, some of the current assumptions uh, we're discussing around unit sizes as well as use mix. Um, our island our island-wide approach to building heights uh, in adding density was uh, prioritizing sun access to uh, key public realm areas. Uh, in our sun access consideration, we've identified five key areas, A to E, that you see on this diagram. Area A uh, is a naturalized river valley. Area B is a future promontory park, both north and south areas. Area C is Old Cherry Street, uh, where uh, many of the heritage buildings that exist today will remain in the new community. The two new key areas uh, now included in the building height consideration, first is area D, which is Keating Channel's water edge, specifically the north side of the channel, and then E, uh, Center Street, um, specifically the north side of the street, sidewalk, which, is, uh, which was a criteria that was carried for from the 2017 uh, precinct plan. So just focusing on first area A, which refers to the area below the top of bank. So that's the pink line that you see um, that was established um, in the PLFP project. And this is really uh, intended to protect sensitive habitat and wetland area uh, there, um, whereby both base and tower heights will be capped to ensure no shadowing between 10 to 4, 18 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon in September uh, for like now. Uh, this radiation study shows cumulative hours of sunlight exposure onto parks and streets between 9 and 6 p.m. during the fall equinox. Uh, this is using the 2024 demonstration plan heights. As you can see, all key public areas receive a minimum of five hours of cumulative sunlight. Area B, which I spoke about, Promontory Park North and South, um, most of this area will see about 20, 10 hours of total sunlight hours, um, also Area C, which is uh, future Old Cherry Street, and Silo Park Square that touches um, Keating Channel, um, shows roughly about six hours of total sunlight hours, uh, cumulative hours. Uh, East-West streets uh, inevitably will have more impact on shadow because of the sun path, uh, but uh, lowering the, uh, the south or southwestern areas of block can help increase sunlight access onto the inner blocks. Uh, sun access criteria for areas D and E. Um, again, D is the Keating Channel North uh, Water's Edge Promenade and E is the Center Street, uh, slightly more specific. Um, and this is set by no shadow uh, onto certain areas at noon during fall equinox. So for area D, um, that is the north side of Water's Edge between New Cherry and Future Munitions Bridge, whereby tower heights were limited so that no shadow onto the north side of Keating Channel uh, was permitted. So that, that was a tower uh, height cap uh, for that area. Uh, for area E is the north side, of, north side of the center street, whereby the base buildings will be subject to a performance standard uh, to achieve sun on the north side of the street. Um, this was again identified during the 2017 plan, which we have carried forward in, in the new plan. Uh, looking at the height strategy from elevation view, this is a 2017 precinct plan. Uh, there were tall towers only on the north blocks in the 2017 plan, which undulated uh, slightly from west to east. Uh, the 2024 demonst demonstration plan shows a height peak at New Cherry Street, as I said, uh, generally going down to the west as well as the south, uh, and more dramatically as you go towards the east, and uh, this is as a result of avoiding that the shadow um, on the sensitive new habitat areas of the river valley, which I explained in area A. Uh, zooming out to capture what is north to Villiers, uh, this is a citywide section elevation showing base and tower heights of the 2024 demo plan, 
within the context of the proposed developments to the north. So you see a key map on the bottom left there looking north. Um, you can see Keyside, Keating West Precincts, as well as West Downlands uh, behind uh, Villiers Island. Uh, in general, the tower heights are similar to Keating West Towers um, heights around 45 at peak and shorter uh, tower, but shorter tower heights compared to Keyside development. Um, zooming further out, so this is the citywide skyline elevation showing uh, Villiers in the magenta. Uh, within the larger waterfront context. As you can see, the tower heights are significantly shorter com um, compared to um, such as uh, Lower Young Precinct. This is a section, uh, north-south section, looking eastwards, um, shown in the key map there. Uh, you can see the three clusters in pink uh, of the Villiers Island massing, uh, the heights lowest at, along the Keating Channel interface, uh, and then highest in the center, and then again, lowering gently towards the Don River. This diagram shows the location and heights of the demonstration plan uh, and plan. Uh, the bluer tones are the taller heights. As I mentioned, the Western area is generally the, the, the high, the taller towers. The darkest blue are the tallest at 45 to 48 stories along the new Ch uh, Cherry Street gateway. Uh, the tall towers uh, with a lighter blue, uh, ranging from 35 to 44 stories, um, and that is generally within the four westerly blocks. Uh, the lower towers are in yellow tone, uh, ranging from 12 to 24 stories. Um, one of the consideration in increasing density was to uh, avoid towers being clustered too closely. Um, and as you saw in the skyline elevations, most towers across the waterfront are minimum of 25 meter tower separation. On Villiers, we will have a minimum of 40 meter tower separation, uh, so that given the number of towers clustered on the island, um, the shadows can move uh, fairly quickly from hour to hour throughout the day. And we can show you that uh, in a second. Uh, in zoning, um, the tower areas will be fairly flexible uh, with, with regards to where they, um, the tower can be placed within each block as shown here in the pink. Um, so again, towers can essentially be anywhere within this zone with the sign setbacks as well as the minimum 40 meter separation. Um, this is the same point in three dimension. So the demonstration massing in, in white uh, shown with the permitted tower zone uh, in the pink envelope. Uh, for the tower setback, uh, most blocks and frontages have a minimum six meter tower setback, uh, with the exception of three meters along Villiers Street north side and 10 meters along Villiers Street south side and 40 meter tower setback along the east side of Old Cherry Street. Um, the increased setbacks along Villiers south side and Old Cherry east side were established uh, in official plan policy to visually maintain base height street wall where heritage buildings were fronting the street. Um, these are minim these are minimums, um, and at site plan application stage, the city will review the required wind study um, to determine the final setbacks for each future uh, development proposal. Uh, as an example, um, showing just the impact of the tower setbacks, this is a view looking south uh, down the new Cherry Street Bridge. So as you as you're on the other side of uh, Keating Channel, looking down. Um, uh, sorry, this is the uh, Villiers 2017 plan. Uh, one of the options from the last June DRP, we showed added height on the gateway towers with three meter setback. And with the 2024 plan, with a base height increase to a maximum of 10 story, uh, we have provided a base datum height of eight story before stepping back to a maximum of 10 stories with a six meter tower setback from the building face. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our approach to increasing base building heights, uh, which were more incremental. Uh, we spoke about this at our last DRP, but uh, we know that based on the street grid orientation that as you go higher, uh, there will be impacts to the east-west streets uh, regarding shadow. Uh, but we also see the opportunity to create uh, a larger um, street wall to right-of-way ratio where possible. Uh, so what we did was we tested the impact of maximizing base heights incrementally by adding floors to the established base building heights in uh, 2017 precinct plan, which ranged between six to eight stories. So this GIF really shows you as you add additional floor, what will be the shadow impact. 
Um, I think the key takeaway here was the recommended base building heights can be raised one to two stories additionally without major shadow impact. And but any taller, um, paying close attention to impacts on east west streets uh, would be necessary. So uh, carving or stepping the buildings would be encouraged to maintain uh, sun access onto the public realm during the shoulder seasons. Uh, these are the maximum base heights and step backs uh, across the island uh, in our 2024 demonstration plan. Um, the towers here, uh, just to uh, focus on the base heights, uh, are shown in white. Uh, the tallest base buildings in the Villiers Island um, 2017 plan um, is 10 stories. Um, we did not increase this maximum base height, but rather we permitted more base buildings to reach this maximum height, which is up to 10 stories. Uh, south of Villiers, across the 10 blocks, the base buildings will be a maximum of 10 stories with a base datum street wall height uh, ranging between six to eight stories before stepping back a minimum of three meters. North of Village Street on the blocks facing Keating Channel, uh, the base heights will be seven stories with some moderate to shorter tower elements above. Um, some key street interface um, with the street level views, uh, first along Commissioner Street, uh, which uh, Chris explained uh, will be a multimodal complete street uh, with dedicated transit and cycling lanes and a generous public realm uh, fronting southward onto the River Park North and the New River Valley. A uh, view taken uh, from the corner of New Cherry and Commissioner Street, uh, which you'll see in the key map there with the red dot, um, uh, looking east towards the Fire Hall and Don Roadway. Uh, the 2017 Villiers plan had six-story base datum with some short bump ups, but the 2017 plan did not uh, permit any towers to the south. So this is the view that uh, was in 2017. Uh, we presented last year's DRP with a, a slightly higher seven-story datum um, and received suggestions for more height commission along commissioners to create more of a denser um, interface along the urban along the edge of the park. Um, our 2024 plan increased maximum base heights, as I said, to 10 stories, uh, but we maintained a street wall datum of eight stories before stepping back, uh, which will wrap around and carry along, uh, along the north-south um, sides of the, the southern, southern blocks. Moving north, focusing on Center Street, which will be a pedestrian priority street, uh, connecting Promontory Park to Villiers Park, which is a local uh, program park. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you compare the center street section to the left, which is the 2017 plan, while the base building heights have been increased up to 10 stories, the sun access criteria, which is to achieve full sun at 1218 on the north side of the street has been carried forward. So the resulting form, as you can see, is this angular plane um, on the south side of building uh, on the base facing center street from six story to one story. <clears throat> Another consideration in the 2024 plan is the fact that we have permitted towers south of Center Street, uh, which the 2017 plan did not allow for. Therefore, as you can see in this sort of hour by hour GIF showing shadow impacts between noon and 4 p.m., uh, the towers, depending on their general location, uh, will cast shadow onto the streets and courtyards, even with the base buildings being limited uh, to stepping or angular plane to achieve the sun access criteria. Um, just worth noting that uh, we limited the floor plates uh, no greater than 750 square meters. Um, and again, minimum separation of 40 meter between one another. Um, so the shadow towers, again, as I mentioned, are moving uh, fairly quickly hour by hour across both the public realm, but also the podium uh, rooftops. The view taken from Promontory Park, uh, if, if you look at the key map in the red, uh, looking east down Center Street, this is a 2017 plan. Again, there was the stepping, no towers to the south. Last June DRP uh, increased base heights, 10 story max. Uh, our 2024 plan shows the stepping above six story line, datum line. And this simple massing shows an iteration of um, a stepping back, uh, which again also can be illustrated with angular plane up to 10 stories uh, to achieve that sunlight criteria. Um, <clears throat> Moving uh, north, uh, Keating Channel interface, uh, we've added density on all blocks uh, since the 2017. Uh, the base buildings for the blocks between Cherry Street and Munition Street will have a maximum height of seven stories. 
uh, and tower above are permitted to maximum heights of 19 or 20 uh, to, in, to avoid any shadowing on, on the north side of Keating Channel at noon on September 20th. Uh, as a reminder of our last DRP, we explored how we might increase density along Keating Channel, which was not contemplated at the time of the precinct plan. On the left is a diagram showing the 2017 plan, um, which aimed to frame, um, quote unquote, an urban living room uh, with short buildings along Keating Channel. Um, and our Keating Channel uh, with a waterway, which is around 36 meter uh, up to 60 meter, and the right of ways ranging from 75 to 90 meters. So the iterations that we presented last had explored different height approaches to test this right of way uh, ratio uh, from the top being the highest, which was one to two, similar to Chicago River condition. The middle is with shorter towers at one to one right of way ratio. And lastly, the bottom is um, shorter around 40 meters, which will create about a one to 0 0.5 ratio. Um, this is a 2024 demonstration plan in result in section uh, cutting through the middle uh, looking east and you can see the 19 to 20 story, um, which is approximately 60 meter uh, where we landed uh, tower heights facing the channel. Some bird's eye view looking along the Keating Channel comparing Billiards Island 2017. So you just focus along Keating Channel there, 2017, and our 2024 demonstration plan. Bury Street, um, planned to be a non vehicular street with uh, that rendering that was shown. Uh, the buildings along the west side of Old Cherry has been limited to six stories in the 2017 plan. Um, this is the view uh, looking from Commissioner Street up towards uh, the silo um, in the key map that you can see. This is the 2017 plan. Um, last DRP, we examined taller base heights uh, and the impact to the street. And we showed a stepping back of six story datum, um, which made sense to avoid the street while being uh, contiguous all the way up to eight story. Uh, we maintained the 2017 precinct plan base datum uh, in our height increase uh, up to 10 story maximum. So the views along the Heritage Street hasn't changed much. Looking the other way uh, from Silo Park down towards uh, Commissioner Street, the other way, um, here's the 2017 plan compared to the 2024 uh, with, again, ma added maximum base heights, but keeping the six story datum. <laughs> Billiard Street, uh, currently a local street type uh, connecting new cherry and new munitions. Uh, the 2017 2017 plan showed a low rise, um, two to three story building on the north side of Villiers um, and was intended to have a view towards the silo from the street. Uh, last year, P we presented um, in one of our options, a fairly robust development along that Keating block um, to the right, uh, which included base podiums uh, that was around eight stories um, and uh, which from street view uh, looked like this. And then 2024 plan, uh, creating a more consistent base datum height of seven stories on both north and south sides and a step back requirement um, of the heights above that datum. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk um, about uh, the mid block connections and porosity. Uh, how can we achieve finer green blocks within the current block pattern, especially for the larger and longer blocks that are focused really on the western and eastern sides of um, of the island. Um, our approach was first in our general massing, showing conceptual breaks and separation shown here in the green spaces and the arrows, um, really to indicate a through block connection to the public spaces and key destinations within the island, uh, not only along the streets, but through laneways or mews or through courtyard openings, um, depending on the building siting and development stage. Um, and the public spaces and program in Pormontory Park North, Villiers Park, and Keating Channel, which Chris mentioned that is still to be designed. Uh, these can be examined further to meet the pedestrian, pedestrian desire lines um, as well. Um, how should we ensure porosity? Uh, this shows one of the block examples we looked at, P07, which is the block to the top left there. Um, the longest block, um, one of the longest block in our in our uh, prison plan, uh, which we showed our dem demonstrative massing, which is based on built examples and typical building widths that we examined both locally and internationally. 
Um, so in the zoning, we're establishing a maximum GFA for the block. Um, we're, we incorporated this porosity percentage, uh, which in this case was about 70 to 75% of the crude extrusion of the block. Um, so the base building volume has a limit volumetrically. Um, and this takeout was then tested um, on the two right diagrams with other generic massing uh, with an enclosed courtyard type configuration, uh, building depth of about 21 meters with one to two mid block connections, meaning building separation, um, and which gave an equivalent um, yield. Uh, so we think that we're in the right range with regards to the demonstration massing that reflects the porosity we want to achieve uh, in our base volumes. We also looked at many mid-block connections uh, with taller bases, uh, ranging from eight stories all the way up to 20-story buildings and how they provide por porosity through the block as well, breaking down the street wall that would be otherwise fairly um, long. So a few of these, this is also VIA, um, designed by SLH with Perkins and Will. Uh, it's a commercial uh, building with ground floor retail use, um, occupying a street corner. Uh, the building is around seven story lowest and stepping all the way up to 11 stories. The interesting aspect is the desire line that cuts uh, through the block, uh, which also opens up the corner and breaks up the, the otherwise long street wall. It's quite effective, this mid-block connection we measured around seven to 10 meter break. A local example of the Silly District, corner of Mill and Parliament Street. Uh, this is the diagonal entrance into the district, a mid-block connection that um, captures this desire line for those coming from Mill or Esplanade. This width was about 11 meters with building heights ranging from six to 11 stories, which is the building to the south. Um, we looked at uh, Oslo, a lot of wa Oslo waterfront districts, uh, quite walkable, um, even through larger linear blocks. Uh, this area is called Vispevica or Bjorvika, uh, which is near uh, the Oslo Opera House. Uh, it's a newer development area. Um, one of which we looked at is essentially a fairly similar block size seen in Villiers, which has three buildings with a mid block and courtyard carved out. Uh, so you can see the plan uh, on the gray there. Um, so the, from the north side of the block, one can enter through the opening, walk through the courtyard, through the breezeway, all the way down to the water, water's edge. So we, we tested, measured these mid-block openings, um, ranging around 7 to 10 meters, um, and some of the other European uh, courtyard configurations were measuring even tighter openings. I uh, just noticed that this Pavica where uh, we just showed is the Barco development uh, across the street. Um, and this was, I think, mentioned previously in the DRP. Um, while this development is unique uh, in the master planning, the north-south connections are quite linear. Uh, there's also an east-west breezeway um, in many of these bar buildings, which allow pedestrians to also traverse not only north-south again, but parallel uh, along the um, along the blocks. So the separation between buildings on the same block um, that we have currently in our demonstration plan will be a minimum of 11 meters on the short face of building. Uh, if the mid block connection is between two long faces of the building, the distance between the long faces above the first story, uh, city urban design is stating that it should be 15 meters. So this is something that we haven't resolved yet, but we're looking into um, identifying what would be the, the right um, width for that. Uh, others, uh, other uh, mid-block connections that you see here are more conceptual, uh, as we do not know how the buildings itself will be sited or carved. Um, but uh, we believe that the example of the Keating channel area, channel area that you can see sort of three breaks there, uh, we show a lot of porosity uh, in our demo plan. Um, to make sure that the development yield considers this block porosity takeout. Uh, concluding with bird's eye view, um, different angle um, from a typical uh, southeast angle. So this is the um, view looking from northeast, uh, northwest, sorry, village 2018 demonstration plan, village 2017, and demonstration. And last slide, I'll hand it over back to Anthony uh, on the next steps.
next steps are to, of course, um, make certain that we consider all the commentary that we're receiving from this panel, as well as our last public engagement uh, exercise that we're undertaking on May 2nd. That's going to be in person. Um, moving forward with finalizing the Villiers Island precinct plan update and the policy and zoning and bringing this forward to water um, to planning and housing committee um, in June for adoption. And then we are planning on moving forward with the indigenous engagement exercise that we're undertaking to rename the island, as well as public realm and many of the streets. And that public engagement is anticipated to be ongoing for six to 12 months. And then we're going to move forward with the phasing implementation plans for the streets and public realm designs. And that is going to be within the next 12 months. And that's going to result in a further update to the Billiards Island precinct plan. Okay, that concludes everything. Thank you very much for extensive uh, presentation. So um, there's a lot there. Uh, we're going to go through our usual process of questions first and then comments. And uh, Bessie's eager to start. So first question. I just need a clarification on we are looking at primarily a demonstration passing in this presentation. And you spoke about the loose fit between the zoning and this presentation massing. Is there a drawing that clearly shows what the zoning envelope is that is outside of this presentation massing? Because I think that's, I think that was, I think maybe one slide had that, but that really is the crux of what we're talking about here is how much flexibility is there in that, in the um, zoning to potentially move outside the borders that you're showing us in this presentation? Have that. Yes. So do you want us to share that? Yeah, can yeah, you exactly. maybe just we'll it go through that one more time, showing the differences in between? I think you guys, again, both need to speak up a little. Oh, a little okay. back here. Sorry. Right. Yep. So while she's well raised pulling this up, so the approach to zoning is basically we're just creating a very broad box based upon the limits of the demonstration plan when it came to the base buildings carving out the essential setbacks and setbacks, and then large tower zones that are defined actually by the tower, uh, the tower setbacks themselves from the property line. So the towers can float anywhere within those areas and many of them are in excess of 2,000 square meters. One with the pink areas. That's the one with the pink the areas. That's the one you need up there. Yeah. yeah. that area is around the towers. That's page 46. Got it? Great. Beautiful. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's yeah. a tower zone. I mean, uh, we don't have a combined <clears> one. <throat> we have it. Well, just to clarify, the, the the pink, the darker pink, they can go anywhere in that area. Correct. Right. And the base, the bases are those shrink wrapped to the gray, or are the bases larger as well? The base will be, um, if you look at the cyan outline. Yeah. If you can imagine that extruded up, mm -hmm. and the only carve out would be the step backs. Yes. Okay. And we're we're not actually. Incorporating any potential mid block connections because that's something that's going to be designed once we go out for competition and then next site plan be from But this would allow for all of those mid block connections. It would allow for any configuration. Porosity and everything that yeah. you've talked about. Yeah, if there was a change in direction, because this is a, the way that we've looked at this is this is a 25 year time horizon. Quite a bit changes in 25 years. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to constrain ourselves as we're moving forward. We've seen with other precinct plans that even after 
10 to 15 years, things change. So we want to provide that flexibility so we can minimize either a rezoning or going to the Committee of Adjustment. 25 years goes by quick. This panel's been around for 20, so <laughs> anyway. Okay, thanks for that. Betsy, any other questions? No? Okay. Um, just go, uh, Eric, do you want to go next? Yes, a couple of questions. Um, one is, so just to build on, on this question, are you then, so there's, there's going to be tower zone, uh, step back, uh, some metrics for, are you planning to also include, like, how are you going to control, is it density per block? How is, it, how is that going to be distributed? Yeah, so like, so what we're, so is there going to be, I guess, a, a, a map of some sort, I will say, yes. each block, so this section is, for sake of argument, seven, another one is five, then four, and that's how, yes. Yeah, so each block uh, is numbered. Um, you have a block time with the numbers. So this is PO7. So each block will have its own maximum GFT cap that incorporates basically the base extrusion minus the setback, minus this um, mid block connection that we're trying to take out so that the full building cannot cover the full ground of that extrusion plus the tower, which is the 750 with a maximum height. That combination will be the total maximum GFA. Okay. What is then the, I'm just trying to, and then what will you include in your OP versus the zoning in terms of the level of details? And because I've seen lately a lot of OP goes into a lot of details, but just trying to understand what's going to be the differentiation. No, we're moving away from providing a great deal of detail within within the official plan policies. So we're providing the overall policy direction and relying on the Lears Island precinct plan, including the update, as well as the zoning to provide the details. Okay. And I've got two more questions. One uh, re relates to um, the land use, because often, I mean, your bill form land use goes hand in hand. Um, are they, what is the land use just mixed use across, or are they specific requirement for employment, uh, non-employment, land across the, I'm just trying to understand, how, how are you gonna mix this and what's gonna go where? So that's actually a very good question. So from a policy perspective, we've decreased the amount of non-residential use to 10%. Uh, prior, it was 20% of the GFA total on the island. And is it? 10%, are you doing it 10% per block or is it a 10% of GFA but focused in an area? It's cumulative. So it's basically cumulative across the entire island and we're not defining except for except for our, um, our priority retail street frontages um, where non-residential is going to be focused. Okay. And my last question is on the... I think it's on the west side of Foundry. There's a tower that's that's higher than the other one. Is that because it's a current application? It's on slide. Um, it appears in a whole, but if we look for west of Foundry, I think it's west east east of Foundry. Sorry, oh, it's sorry. Bet it's between them. Um, uh, yes. So it's okay, in Foundry. Yeah. So that is a private development application, um, and that is also currently the subject of an Ontario Grand Tribunal uh, appeal. It's in the appeal. That's why that one is taller and not quite following your your uh, height peak principle. Yeah, that is that is the the uh, proposal that's that is currently that's currently posted on the city's website. Okay. Uh, let's go to our uh, uh, colleagues online. Bridget, any questions? I just had a, a question about this public program in the middle. 
what is the proposed um, use of that zone in the in the middle, the gray zone that isn't pink? Oh, that's a private development application. And uh, sorry, sorry, could you speak up a little bit? It's a bit hard to hear. Oh, uh, that is that is a, a private a private land that is the subject of a of a development application and is currently uh, under the purview of the Ontario Land Tribunal. I see. So it's actually not owned at all by Waterfront Toronto, and has already been purchased by a private entity. Uh, it was. It is under private ownership. Okay, and I, I believe I should clarify that. Uh, the uh, the zoning bylaw, uh, as well as the official plan amendments, are only for the public lands within Villiers Island, and the private lands are being that's that is the subject of uh, other processes for the private lands. I just have a follow up myself on that uh, for clarification. So, can you tell us what the nature of the application is? The private. Is it for, I don't know, uh, 30 story towers or more or less or well, what is it? Um, public, right? I assume with public um, information. What is publicly available? Um, that, is, that is an equivalent density to and height regime that we're seeing within, within the demonstration plan. So it, that was the formal application that came in. Yes, that was the formal application. <laughs> All right, and it's and it's primarily residential. There's no other uses other than residential, or it's primary residential. Um, commercial activation uses, so retail, commercial, and and other uses that would activate the the frontage. And would this private development come before waterfront design review at some point, uh, 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 in the process? Well, I think it would probably come through the uh, process that the city's doing now with all of the private development applications. So, well, if it gets approved at the OLT, then it probably won't be coming through this process. You guys mm -hmm. don't have to do that. Yeah. So, so presumably, at site plan, it will go through the city and it would come to this panel. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Oh, right. Just yeah. to clarify, Bridget, um, the, the massing we're showing in gray here is from the March 2023 zoning bylaw application, which is public. And what we're showing here in the north is a 47 story and to the south, 39 story. That's the nature of the application. Yes. Right. Thanks. Uh, let's keep going with questions. We'll go back to the panel. Uh, Pina, any questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering about the urban design guidelines and how even those great street sections and um, now presumably the whole sort of refinement of the podium and the above six stories and there's such a great elaborate um, consideration of sun angles. Uh, but I wonder, maybe this is leading in terms of my comments, but ultimately how that podium or so let's just take those consistent six stories, how they hit the ground and whether there's any provision between the difference between, you know, if you're on the north side of Center Street or the south side, you know, and and in that regard, has there been a wind study or is there now with these with this new new height concentrations? Um, I think a wind modeling um, study, just like we measure, you know, effects of sun and shadow, um, only because those winds here are so strong. And I think that the profile of that six story, like let's face it, that's really the pedestrian experience is those first six stories. But I expect that we would need some, you know, setbacks, um, canopies, overhangs that mitigate the wind, but also um make for a pedestrian sidewalk like regardless of the setback right and it was since this is determined that um, a wind study 
which is something that we would like to be undertaking, um, would provide some information, but um, we were relying on wind studies as well as solar access studies, sun shadow, um, and site plan to further refine the overall build form and approach to microclimate. So not just to add to that, yes. Pina, um, we do have experience with tall buildings, working with tall buildings. We know about downwash and we know about channelization of winds. So that's why there is this um, notion of a setback so that it, as the wind comes down the tower, it can be dispersed within the, the, the base building at the top of the base building and then um, come down and disperse onto the pedestrian realm. So that's the pedestrian level wind studies that we, we always undertake. And that's why the form that we see throughout Toronto, our tower and base building form addresses as much as we can those types of, of consistent wind issues. And then we do the individual wind studies uh, through each individual application. Mm -hmm. SPA. Mm -hmm. But, um, okay, second question. <laughs> um, the school, like so, so these non-residential programs and there was in one of the plans, um, the orange um, indicator of school and, and some other, um, public institutional or even cultural designated areas. Um, there, is there any more, if for example, a school, it could be an elementary school and mm -hmm. post-secondary, like what is the process there in terms of that programming? So the school is uh, Toronto District School Board. It is an elementary school. Um, through our, our community services and education process, we work with the Toronto District School Board to reevaluate the size of the facility required. So it has been increased. Um, the location, and I, I think I'm going to I'm going to stress the location of all community facilities is notional at this point. We do have criteria from our various community facilities partners, but that's going to have to be confirmed as we move through development because there is co-location opportunities, there's opportunities to incorporate um, facilities into mixed use developments. And so we're going to, once this area starts developing, we're going to be continually discussing uh, phasing and location and co-location opportunities with all of these partners. So um, based on the criteria that we received thus far, we provided actually the notional location of each of these facilities. Okay, uh, let's go back to uh, online. Fabi, any questions? Yeah, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, quick uh, clarification question. Are the mid-block connections locked in or are they placeholders, their location? The only mid-block connection that has uh, been part of the 2017 Barriers Precinct Plan is that 15-year um, mid-block connection east of uh, Foundry Street that, thanks Josh, uh, he's pointing out there. The other ones are uh, notional. And they're notional based on um, kind of circulation patterns, connection to parks, is it, how can we understand them in relation to the right-of-ways and then the potential scale of the building's fragmentation depending where they sit on the block plan? So, for example, on the west side of the island, it seems like there's a finer grain of buildings because there are more mid-block connections, and then on the east side, there are fewer. Is that just how much can we understand that as the massing, as locked-in massing, or are the mid-block connections going to shift and change, and potentially we might have wider buildings on the west side, on the east, sorry, on the west side, and then we could have more mid-block connections on the east side. Yeah, I don't think it precludes what we're showing um, that there could be only one mid block connection in the eastern yeah. blocks. Um, okay. What would what uh, I explained the mid block porosity is that we have to give each block uh, a GFA cap, and in doing so, uh, we want to make sure that these mid block connections are considered into that takeout of the GFA from the extrusion crude extrusion of the base, so that a we can ensure that there's a porosity. Uh, on top of that, we're also discussing minimum contiguous uh, building street wall before a break has to happen. Mm. And I, um, we're looking at these larger blocks that are going east-west 
as compared to the, 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 the middle blocks, which already has north, north south streets. So uh, the 11 meter, for example, that you see in P07 or P12, these are emotional, but um, we're, we're still looking at that minimum that needs to happen just so that we can then uh, identify that JFA cap to, again, ensure that porosity. So um, what we're trying to show is as much porosity, fine grain. Um, so the 50 meters to the east is also pretty notional. It doesn't mean that there can only be one. Yeah, that's very helpful. And then just one quick follow-up question to Eric's question about land use. Is there a strategy to consider land, land use on the ground floor specifically along streets like Center Street and others that might have a pedestrian, higher focus on pedestrian? So is there some kind of strategy of how land use at the ground floor is being considered where we want to encourage pedestrian, um, a, higher, a higher pedestrian concentration or pedestrian activation? Or is this all case by case? No, and yes, there, there is a study that we're completing at the moment um, to finalize our, our commercial activation strategy uh, across the entire island. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and so we do have, we are refining this approach, but what we're focused on is activation of Old Cherry Street, uh, Center Street, as well as the eastern portion of New Cherry Street, very close to uh, the, the primary transit hub, and um, also along Keating Channel Promenade and Villiers, and Villiers Street, as well as some nodes of activity directly adjacent to the park on Trinity Boulevard. But I think what's very important from a zoning perspective, so this is a strategy, but of course, things evolve over time. Um, demand also, retail service and other commercial animation also will change over time. So we are permitting um, the, what we're calling commercial activation uses, which is a broad suite of uses that are either publicly accessible uh, or provide provide a certain amount of porosity um, into the buildings themselves. We're allowing those actually throughout the island on the first floor. Then we're facing a, uh, a street uh, or a public space or a house. So and Anthony, just for clarity, everything is mixed use. <coughs> everything is mixed, mixed use. use. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, buddy. All right, let's Thank keep you. going. Uh, I'm mindful of the time. It's Absolutely. five to three. So if you can keep your questions and answers short, because we want to get to the comments. So I do. Matt, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to you <laughs> next. Matthew. <laughs> um, yes. In, in refer uh, there, on page seven, there's a reference to an Indigenous cultural interpretive plan. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on what that looks like, who's being consulted, who's producing it, what it affects. And I can provide a brief overview from my colleagues at the front secretariat who are leading this particular exercise, unfortunately are not here today. So um, the team the team is currently working with Minoka Met Collective mm -hmm. um, and the Indigenous Affairs Office uh, to advance a few action items um, related to the overall waterfront approach to Indigenous engagement uh, and planning. And um, part of that exercise is the renaming of the island. So that is the first piece of work that we're really focused on. And that is the part of a broader renaming exercise for the Portlands. Um, also, since this is a broader vision for the Portlands from an indigenous uh, reconciliation perspective, we're looking at it through the lens of economic development, public arts, um, housing, how we deal with public realm as well, and other opportunities to bring an indigenous presence to uh, not just Villiers Island, but the entirety of the Portlands. So, like I said, I can't really expand upon this since my colleagues aren't here, but that is, I think, um, that is the approach we're taking. We're building off some of the work that we've already undertaken um, when we started the some of the other just engagement with 
within the, the port lands, most notably uh, the PICOR Urban Design Guidelines and Digital Engagement exercise, but also the broader waterfront digital engagement strategy that's developed. To Fred Martin or Selena? Yes. Okay, got it. Um, so it, this that plan will have no effect on massing or zoning at all. I would have to actually defer to my colleagues. All right, we'll Secretary follow up on that one then. Um, uh, increase of density of approximately 60% for, for people to live. Is there consideration for an increase proportional to green space or giving some naturalized space back to other species that inhabit this island as well? Mm. So the density increase uh, itself, um, in terms of the parkland, mm -hmm. we are um, providing through the PLFP uh, protection project, uh, including the River Valley, um, that area plus the to be designed park spaces, which is the Promontory Park North and Villiers Park, and the Keating Channel Promenade. Um, that um, park space will be sufficient um, even with the 60% uh, density. Okay, well thank right. you. Yeah. Great, thanks, Matthew. David, just quickly, I, I, yeah, I think this is obvious, but um, I'm assuming on, on these cross sections that we're looking at that the private setbacks, as noted, are are all part of the zoning as well. So we're looking at the relationship of building to the public realm is page 22. As, as we see it on, on say, for example, page 22. Yes, the, uh, codifying the setbacks would be codified. Okay. That's very brief. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Emily. No questions. No questions. Hey, come on. No questions. No question. Oh, my God. All right. So we're going to move to comments. Um, and uh, oh, I'm sorry. You, 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 you yeah, I think we've done. All right. Um, and I uh, uh, will move to comments. And I have uh, received comments from Nina Marie, who could not be here today. And they're very lengthy. So what I've tried to do is summarize them. And I'll try my best to give the, the key points that she has wanted to, or the panel to understand and to share. Um, first of all, she appreciates all the hard work that's been done and makes a very strong point uh, that in her view, uh, this, is, this is not about density. Um, uh, the goals that have been established, uh, I think panel members all understand and they support it. And uh, we're all interested in looking at innovative and creative ways to figure out how to increase the affordable housing supply while increasing the density. So uh, she's very pleased about that. And that's not, that's not a key issue. She does have several concerns that we wanted to share with the panel. And the first, I guess, I would summarize in the sense that um, it appears that the, the, the overall uh, precinct plan looks like and feels like more of the same. Um, century grid dominated by podium and tower, ma tower massing. Uh, there's an uh, impression that uh, this is a precinct or a neighborhood that is perhaps catering more to the car than the pedestrians. Um, and I think that's related to the uh, width of the roads uh, that she's concerned about. Um, more concerning, uh, she goes on to say, is still the, the lack of the uh, active and nuanced public realm. And I think it's important to go back to what Chris said in his opening comments that this is only about massing and a zoning envelope. The public realm is yet to come, uh, and we will see it later for sure. Uh, this is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle being put together, but you got to start with something. And all, all the work that's been done, uh, especially under the, I guess I'll call it the new approval process that our province has blessed upon us, um, you know, it's really important to nail down the zoning envelopes and the general massing. The other thing that's important to understand is what's seen here, they're not buildings. They're just, you know, notional to, to uh, be possibilities that could be accommodated within those, 
those zones. So um, obviously she wasn't here, so she didn't hear Chris's uh, presentation. So I think um, uh, she might feel a little better about that if she had heard it. But nevertheless, uh, it's important to emphasize that her main concern is the, the lack of the public realm. She emphasizes, as we all know, that uh, Waterfront Toronto prides itself on leading with landscape, uh, which we all agree with. And um, I guess ideally what she would have liked to have seen is that be the first step. We all know that sort of the fundamentals of precinct planning, streets, blocks, open spaces. And, um, you know, designing streets, what are the blocks, what are the open spaces, how do all the pieces come together is a normal process. But, uh, but I think the preference that she's enunciating here is she wished this could uh, lead with landscape. Uh, another point was related to the width of the streets and narrower streets at multiple scales. It really, really is calling for uh, greater attention to diversity of streets, widths, the porosity, the through block connections, finer grain, uh, a, a development pattern throughout this this entire precinct, which again, going back to what Chris said, I guess is yet to come. And I, saw, I think I've interpreted correctly to, from the presentation that that flexibility is there to accommodate all that as you move through these stages. And uh, the one slide that you had up there is, I think it was roughly 12 months from now when we would see that level of detail that perhaps, you know, we would love to see right now, but it's not there yet. Um, uh, more interior courtyards, uh, meandering pedestrian paths, bike corridors, all those kinds of details uh, she's concerned about, and rightly so, but they will they will come. And I guess, I guess the final uh, comment that uh, she wanted me to share is, She's really making a plea here to avoid, as she calls it, avoid the trap of old patterns that we know. And the one slide that we saw there that showed the, the, uh, the built form of uh, Villiers Island against uh, the Cleary District, and the rest of the waterfront, I, I think probably speaks to her point uh, more than others, that it, it looks and feels like more of the same. And, and that's her concern. Uh, this is an island very special, spent a fortune to reroute a river. It should be different. It should feel really different. Um, it should be dense. It should be uh, uh, inviting. It should be full of public realm. It should achieve all the things that are in the goals and the aspirations. But above all, I think what she's saying is more work needs to be done to try and figure out how can it be look, feel, and touch, and experience differently than a traditional Toronto development. So I, I think that's where she's coming from. And, and, and the final thing I'll say is that, um, you know, we're planning this, and it's been mentioned by various people, this is probably a 25-year build-out, maybe sooner, maybe not. Obviously, it depends on the market. Um, and we got to be planning, you know, for that long-term perspective. And uh, so if you're thinking 25 years from now, and this is all built out, and people living there, what will they say about it? I live in the most unbelievable environment, unbelievable island in the lake, et cetera, et cetera, that looks and feels different than what we see elsewhere in the city. So I think I'm trying to summarize. Uh, it's a two-page uh, series of comments, but I think that's where she's coming from. And I told her that I would certainly be happy to share those comments with the panel. So with that in mind, let me go to... Uh, our panel members and Betsy would, I think, like to start. I mean, I, I agree with her comments in the sense that when we reviewed McCleary last week, we essentially talked to Create TO and the design team and with exactly the same language that I'm, I'm anticipating that we're going to hear around the table today, that we're, we're seeing very similar types of block development and massive development. And in these areas, particularly on the waterfront that can handle a different kind of density, a different kind of building, we should be pursuing zoning that allows even more flexibility than you've shown today. I very much appreciate that you've done so much thorough work to get to where we are. Um, and so um, a little anecdote is, uh, not anecdote, but the this, this outer, these two out of scope blocks in the center are real, a real problem in this area. And if there's anything that 
Waterfront Toronto can do um, to bring those into this world of conversation, I think that would be really important because with new munition and new cherry coming through and commissioners essentially set because it's the transit street, it basically takes the center out of a, a six block chunk that actually could be developed in a very different way. So I'm not sure what can, what can be had. I know it must be frustrating for everyone at this table to see that. Um, we need to ensure that the development coordinates with the street objectives and with the park objectives that Waterfront Toronto has already put in place. Both are quite ambitious. The fact that there's potential for many of the streets in this neighborhood to be turned into 100% pedestrian only streets is really extraordinary to have that planned in from the beginning. And as that design comes forward, when these streets are you know, designed and when the public realm is designed, I think we're all gonna be pushing for that even from day one. The pedestrian experience is incredibly tough to regulate in Toronto. As we know, it's very hard to create a neighborhood with podium tower blocks. And what the last 10 years have taught us is that we have to acknowledge that the density will increase on this island, even with the increased density that you've already planned for. Um, 9,000 units could go to 12, could go to 15. Like we know that's, we know that's going to happen, especially over the next 25 years. So I would encourage adding a lot more to the GFA cap, eliminate the step backs, that pink around all the bases and towers. I kind of like the pink, you know, blow out the pink a little bit more and just have like basically a big massing that is then regulated more when we're seeing the design as opposed to baking in the shape and form of the buildings today. Um, the mid block porosity, as we know, is really important. And it, that kind of regulation will allow, and I, what I'm understanding is that it's almost like a percentage calculation. So even if you increase the GFA, and should you increase the GFA, that would mean you would have to have more mid block porosity in relationship to that increased GFA, if I'm understanding the calculation correctly, I might be wrong. Um, we'll allow the panel in the city to review design proposals case by case to ensure that there's the ability to relate the public realm across the precinct in relationship to the massing. Because both of these things are essentially gonna be designed separately, but have to kind of create cohesion. Um, the demonstration plan is my last comment, probably the only really negative one is that kind of reads as really limiting. Like I appreciate you have to start somewhere, but um, I would really, really encourage um, the city and waterfront to, you know, this is one step. Now we've all adjusted our eyes. We need to see the adjustment that's going to take us 25 years into the future. Okay, hey, thanks, uh, Betsy. Um, I'll go uh, to uh, Bridget. Uh, comments, Bridget? Yeah, uh, thank you. First of all, I thought it was an extremely um, extensive and thoughtful presentation, really giving us visuals to really understand <clears throat> the issues at hand. Uh, so it's really appreciated. Um, in the other part of the waterfront further west, <clears throat> where we have the Safety building, the Architectonica building, there's kind of an emerging public realm of these mid-block connections <clears throat> that I think is actually really interesting as a kind of response to a neighborhood scale, as opposed to Queens Key or Lakeshore, which are the larger streets. Uh, <clears throat> and in a way, there was a, a plan that was uh, a massing that we saw uh, here where they were talking about uh, porosity and the, a mid-block connection 21 meters wide <clears throat> with a courtyard could have between one to two mid-block uh, north-south connections, especially in the blocks further to the west of Villiers Island. <clears throat> um, and in a way, I, I think for me, that's a really important uh, thing to add to the public realm to uh, because in a way the podium building becomes like an eight story podium typically around uh, the island. So the idea of having the mid block connection uh, in the north south direction um, is actually really important because it actually starts to break down the scale, especially when you're adding height. So it actually, I think, does some really good things for you. Uh, there's a drawing. There's another one that's a massing where you're showing th a few different options, and it had uh, sort of two different north-south connections. It's a, it looks like an axonometric in green, uh, and if you could find that, that would be super helpful. Um, 
this one here. So the one in the middle starts to take what is a big podium block and break it down. And, and I guess for me, uh, at this stage, my question is, you know, does that, do those north-south links uh, show up as a right-of-way and a kind of, and a literally a part of the public realm that needs to be addressed? Or is it up to each developer to decide how many north-south porous connections there are and how much space they want to give up. Uh, <clears throat> I guess for me, it would be really um, positive to actually make some of these north-south connections part of a public system of right-of-ways, um, accessing the courtyards, creating a finer block so you don't end up with a big eight-story huge podium and then the only decision is where you put your tower <clears throat> within, within a big, big block. Uh, so already by by addressing the middle massing, uh, especially, if, I mean, you're, you were saying it was related to the blocks to the west end of Villiers, but I could imagine a strategy, strategy like this addressing both the west all the way to the east and actually finding a way to both break down the block, but still provide flexibility for the vertical podium, uh, the vertical tower within the podium. Um, and for me, that that would be really, uh, I think, a very positive thing to not just have it be a nice thing uh, on a on a plan, but actually part of a system of right of ways that are kind of part of this uh, <coughs> um, framework that we're creating. Um, I I also <coughs> feel that um, billiards will be this amazing thing because it will be a dense community. Um, surrounded by parks and water. It's it's such an unusual and an incredible thing that uh, has been created by this flood retention. I would love to see no cars on Villiers. Um, in a way, we talked, I, I think I brought this up a long time ago in one of our meetings uh, to kind of create, in effect, a unique community uh, uh, with either very little or almost no parking requirements uh, so that you could, you still had transit, you could still drive there. And then I really want to underline Betsy's comment about the fact that if you can, in effect, build them now with, with uh, car lanes, and then eventually those could disappear to be all pedestrian, I think it would be pretty amazing and provide a future flexibility over time that I think is really, uh, really important. Uh, but I appreciate all of the kind of uh, extensive work in presenting this to us. <clears throat> and I feel like um, given the timeline that we're working with, I guess some of these key decisions of block structure <clears throat> are going to set the kind of path for the future. And so I, I see them as actually really important in terms of um, both um, the breaking down the scale even now and ensuring that there's a way to have this finer grain <clears throat> mid-block connection that will become in effect a kind of key signature for this whole Villiers Island precinct. And, and I just feel like it, it allows maybe for different architects to develop different pieces of the podium, whereas the singular piece then requires it to be mo fairly monolithic and of one hand. And so this kind of, some of the images that you showed us before could actually be realized if this block structure and this porosity and uh, mid-block connection were literally um, part of the kind of uh, um, uh, right-of-ways and the kind of, uh, it, it needs to be described in a different way in the plan. Uh, but thank you for a great presentation. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Go back to the panel, Pina. Or sorry, Eric, I'll just go down. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Paul. Um, thank you for thorough presentation. I think there's lots of uh, interesting um, idea here. I think that the, you know, I think the having the higher height at the station, at the transit is something that is uh, makes more, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, what I would do is I just building on Betsy's comment is I think you're going to have to simplify the zoning in terms of your approach currently, because I have this feeling that because I, there's a lot of step backs. I see, for example, around Center Street, you have a series of, of, of four different step backs. It's like an additional 12 meters. Um, those are actually really hard to build. They add a lot of cost to construction. They, and also they, they influence the floor plate of your building. So one thing is the, I think, because they, 
I have this feeling, yeah, you, you're going to have a lot of rezoning uh, requests because there is, you even trying to give a lot of flexibility, I think you are actually probably over prescriptive on some of these elements. I would say, for example, that along Center Street, um, you know, the, all the stepping and, you know, maybe it's a question of Center Street, maybe it's a bit of a, maybe you, you bring it because it's a, a lower scale, maybe it's just to bring a bit down and maybe shift the density to the outside along Villiers and Commissioner. Maybe because those are really wide right away and maybe they can take uh, take more there. Um, like Old Cherry and Villiers, you know, there's only one step, step back. That's simple enough. I think that the second you start putting a step back and then you go up another step and then you put your tower, this is when, you know, costs go up. Uh, but also the livability of the unit is, is something that has actually become very tricky. Um, I think I also, looking at the massing that you have, I would love to see, a, a bit like you have your Oslo example, I would love to see a series of testing about how some of your floor plate appears very deep. Like the second you get a, a base building that is more than 22, you can 20, you know, 23, you start to have units that are extremely deep and what we call like, you know, like not, not very useful density. So the way I see it is um, having a bit more detail on what these floor plates are. Um, also, because what I think is if they're too deep, your developer at one point is going to come back and try to reuse them and probably increase the height of, of, of the building, which might be OK. So I think it's like it is testing the density that you're providing is correct because you only have 10 percent of non resi, which is probably going to be at the base of the building. But that's something that is um, that is uh, that is uh, worth looking at. Um, you're showing for, <clears throat> on the west side, uh, east side, for example, a, a full perimeter buildings. They, not too many examples of those around. I think that again, because dealing with corners are always things that um, are very difficult. So again, I think someone who tries to develop that building is just kind of try to break the massing and probably shift. So just again, testing so that you can get enough um, flexibility uh, in this thing. Um, the I think that the um, you know I think again some of your tower set step back or step back like six meters like some of them are, are are odd numbers so I think again as much simpl simplify this as much as possible on the mid block connection I think this is some interesting idea they work often very well on smaller scale buildings when we get to density of seven and more and all that it needs to be tested hand in hand with your servicing strategies where's the pickup of the garbage all the all the things that are not sexy but needs to be taken into account because i have this feeling that some of the blocks here are probably you know where you want to have your servicing lane where your truck are going to come in where you need to where people are going to be moving in and out um, I think are going to start to have major conflicts with those mid block. I like the area, the, the one that are close to the, um, that are in the area around the, I can't remember if it's Foundry or the other street. Um, along the one on the east side of, uh, of the Foundry, I think there's kind of a nice scale there and, and then, but I think that as you get, for example, to the block that are west of Cherry, I think that's, Probably the the land, the your mid block connection and your servicing strategies, I suspect are completely going to um, uh, conflicts with one another. So it's just again testing to make sure that the principle and then ideas are actual um, are actually compatible. Um, the layer of um, of land use to the ground floor, I think, is is something that <clears throat> in the next iteration, I think we'd like to see um, where you're going to focus, especially your retail activity, even on on, on your center, center street, uh, looking at the previous that you had a little schedule where you had a the retail and the activities more focused along Cherry and 
along Old Cherry. I suspect that's probably as much as you'll get of the great activities. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a place that is more appropriate for sun penetration. Maybe it's not quite as important as you get to the uh, to the east side of, of that area. So again, I wouldn't want to be too dogmatic. And again, it's I think it's a question of trying to simplify as much as possible the uh, uh, your rules here. Um, and I think I will. We'll keep it at that for now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fatty? Comments? Uh, uh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the extensive work uh, with the amazing city and Waterfront Toronto staff put into this to juggle so many expectations on this very important site. Um, it's no easy task. Um, I just want to say that it's also just a bit difficult for me to reconcile just as a given that the massing and zoning are somehow separate from the resulting public realm strategy. And what this presentation proved to me is that there's actually serious thinking and iterative thinking that went on by the team to undertake some kind of measure to ensure that the public realm is not an afterthought, but that in fact it's integrated and generative of the massing in the block plan itself. So. In that spirit, again, of a very prominent site uh, on a project on, of an island of almost continuous public land, I think it would go a long way to just simply demonstrate that there is indeed a reciprocal relationship between the massing and the public realm and the streetscape, um, that they're all related. And I think one way that we could really do that is in these mid-block connections, um, not to uh, harp on what um, Sorry, not to repeat so much of what Bridget said, but I think it's really clear that there is some sort of very deep thinking that went on uh, by the team to try to understand the hierarchy of public realm and pedestrian connections and buildings relationships to them. Um, I think also the streetscape plan that Chris presented is encouraging with this idea that these centers, a street like Center Street might one day become pedestrian. So there is some thinking behind those things. And I think it's really, it would just would make this uh, presentation um, in some ways seem more robust if we can start to see those things as intertwined. Um, I strongly support the increased density, uh, especially the taller buildings along the perimeter and near the transit stops. And so in response to that, you know, these mid-block connections that are also can become a much clearer idea uh, if we start to carve them with another hierarchy of circulation in mind, as well as ground floor um, animation and programs. Um, maybe one study that could be helpful is to maybe do a kind of like black and white figure ground study comparison of some of these wonderful precedents from Oslo and Barcelona, or even the distillery in Kensington and Villiers to try to see how the building footprints, uh, the zoning and the other network of kind of urban circulation goes hand in hand with uh, the placement of buildings and how they could then in turn create a finer grain uh, block pattern within the general grid. So I just, you know, I just want to encourage the team to continue on with what they're doing, but while taking in mind that what's happening within these finer mid blocks is actually something that really helps shapes helps shape zoning um, and massing and building envelopes in a way that I think this place would warrant. So in some sense, a ton of a ton more flexibility in the shape of the buildings or the placement of the buildings, but a bit more control and a finer grain um, circulation network at the ground level that then re results in a much, much more robust uh, and pedestrian oriented public realm. Uh, but thank you so much. I think there's a lot of fantastic, uh, a, a lot of fantastic seeds that uh, would would be great to see uh, developed further. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Pina. Yes, um, I actually just want to continue what Fadi uh, was saying. I, I think that um, one of the aspects of so much thinking that has gone into this is is that we are seeing what the potential is, um, but also what the incredible challenge is to try to prescribe something without over-determining, you know, ultimately what's get, what gets built. And we do depend on the creativity and, and even, you know, things that as a group at this moment in time, especially because in the future, you know, things evolve, we want to give that loose shirt as it's described in. Um, in your presentation, so so it, having said that, I actually think that the that Chris's presentation of the street types 
was so clear as a kind of rationale. So I feel like that even though there are things that are absolutely sacred um, in terms of, of really dictating these are the design standards that, that need to be abided by and these are the reasons and this is the nature of it, um, and this is the difference between them, I think we should be doing the same with the mid-block connections. So I find myself that there's two, two types of mid-block connections um, towards the east side, which are misaligned. And I find those the, myth, the most exciting. But I appreciate that actually there need to be some, like, for example, one um, that is here that likely should be like from water, body of water to body of water in some form, like it doesn't have to be all consistent, but it do, there does want to be that alignment um, and sometimes not. So could there be actually um, a strategy of, of uh, mid-block connection typology without being over-determining, you know, in terms of the response, but that there's an, at least a control or identification of where that happens. Um, in that regard, I think that it is very dangerous to, um, how, oh my God, very dangerous. It's not that easy. Um, it's, uh, but I do think that there is a lot of risk in actually um, having the retail at grade be a unanimous condition, like wrapping um, a podium in retail is so antithetical to the way, you know, that should be, and I think that that there should be a retail rationale that actually is more loop-like. Like, what's the five-minute walk that is a loop? Because most people, like, you know, you're not. It, it's not this kind of endless long street of Center Street or um, New Cherry Street. It's actually a loop, and maybe it emanates from New Cherry Street where there's that pedestrian, but it's it goes sideways, like one big loop site, you know, this is a seven minute loop. This is a, but it's, it actually is more of a rationale that doesn't dilute the retail and also again, leave it to, you know, what some people might interpret as retail <laughs> versus quality of, uh, of space at the street. And again, I just, maybe I was leading with my question, but I think that that um, profile um, especially um, there at New Cherry Street, you know, one side to the other, north side of Center Street versus the south side. Can we bake into the urban um, design guidelines that uh, that profile at the sidewalk with an overhang? And and I appreciate that there's a lot, there's, there's you know, we know a lot about the wind at the waterfront <laughs> and we shape the podium at the upper podium in that way. But I, you know, in my experience, maybe limited, but there needs to be big overhangs. It's not the overhang that mitigates, like on Commissioner Street, that will be a very inhospitable, you know, sidewalk if there isn't some mitigation of the wind of the lake. So in my experience, it's not so much that the, the canopy is important, but the supports of the canopy is really what mitigates the wind, just like the trees in the boulevard might, but that needs to be built in. And I would end, um, I think, by saying that the parkland, um, with this increased density, can we start to consider, especially with all the, the necessary stepping back of the podium, that we can have a park space that is above ground level? Thank you. Matthew. Absolutely. Thank you for the presentation. I'm going to be quick as possible. Um, I'm going to also agree with my colleagues with regards to the mid-block connections. I think it's extremely important for them to also connect something and to allow people to move through these spaces faster. So diagonals where you're crisscrossing through a block. I know those are the ones I use when I'm moving through the city. Which parking lots can I walk across? Which parks can I walk through? There's a great building, building at um, at the corner of uh, Jarvis and Adelaide, Jarvis and Richmond, the view that you can walk right through and it connects you to a corner of a park. So encouraging people to move faster and connecting to nodes, I think is a key component of those aspects as well. I'm just gonna remind everyone that this, you know, used to be the largest wetland in the Great Lakes region. It's at the end of a 37 kilometer long watershed. And the importance of that, and the fact that we're not re rerouting a river, we're re rerouting a river, right? So we moved it once and we're moving it back again. And I think remembering that cities are not just for people, but we need to start making sure that we are 
taking care of all of our relations as well, whether that's the wind, the water, the birds, the bees, all those things have place here as well. And thinking about these connections, it's not just for people, but how do we then connect the trees, connect the water, all these pieces that integrate into our city. And I think by doing so, it's gonna allow us to think about this place in a different way and also honor the natural history of this place. Great, thank you. David, just a couple of quick comments. One is that, um, yeah, thank you for the comprehensive um, presentation and all the research that's gone into it. I fully support the strategy for sun on public space. I know there's a lot of discussion about wanting more shade in public space, but I think in the uh, Toronto is a, uh, becoming more and more of a, um, a climate that is uh, transitional. We have a lot of, 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 uh, kind of spring and fall uh, spring and fall weather that seems to meld into a short winter. Um, I think those I think those sunny uh, public spaces are critical in terms of the success of, of this um, this island. Obviously, it's going to get a certain amount of shade. We all recognize that. I also fully support the idea of somehow codifying these mid-block connections. And I think to Matthew's point, that also provides an opportunity for natural system connections through the blocks as well. So it's not just on the ground plan, because I think that one of the things that's going to be unique about this, this island, if it's done well, is going to be the publicness of the ground plan and the ability to move all through this all through this um, uh, neighborhood in a way that we don't see in other neighborhoods. Maybe the closest is the distillery district. Um, and I also support the idea of these diagonals because I think in the examples that you were showing, diagonals were really what makes these uh, most magical. So with that, great. Well, um, I also support a lot of what has been talked about with the porosity because of the fact that this is such a unique place, this island, and everything how it's been described. I agree with. I also think that it's a bit challenging because, in a sense, the developer can feel like an island within an island. That, that issue of being able to really study this about those connections that everybody's talked about. I think it's really, really important to um, just the, the um, massive design. Um, I also uh, thank you all for uh, looking at the, the sun um, and shade diagrams. I really appreciate that you all listened about um, on the east side of the island that the fact that that whole area of um, is kind of considered part of a neighborhood park and that it, it, it needs to have an um, impact of, um, of having to make students when people are holding back from school and um, active areas, which are, it's, it's a really important part of the larger um, park system that here at, at, at the Portlands. The, the one thing that I'm thinking about though with the introduction of such high density, which is supported, I think that a larger study of understanding the kind of activities that that thousands of people are gonna be wanting here is um, as Matthew said, um, this this area is naturalized and it really needs to to support are parks within this, as, as we all know, but it's not about recreation. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure for recreation, like very specific, like um, uh, for the like. So I wonder if, you know, where that happens within the vicinity of this and whether it can also be thought about in. Up. Like, are there other um, potential ways of thinking about that as you're how um, that aspect could be taken care of? But I would, I would also look at it on a larger scale of, of overall apartments and the other districts that are around because that would be a lot of more recreation. Uh, Kevin, thank you. Um, I, I, I've been taking a lot of notes, um, you know, throughout all the presentations. Just, uh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, 
Um, I guess I, I would like to support uh, maybe an attachment to, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge um, fan and supporter of the TGS. By the time the buildings uh, come for approval, uh, uh, element, um, we'll be in the upper levels of the TGS, so that there'll be quite, uh, there'll be low carbon, um, there'll be that's on the sustainability side. I'm just wondering, um, with the increase in density, I think one of the greatest challenges of satisfying the TGS is the water management. So we're, we're increasing significantly the density on these uh, plots. Is there any way in which we can think about how the public space or public infrastructure can help those private developments manage the, 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 the intense stormwater um, surges that they'll have to they'll have to manage. So I'm just wondering if we can kind of bake that into the the overall planning infrastructure. Thanks very much. Okay, I think we got everybody now. Um, okay, thank you for all your comments. I'll do my best to summarize what I think where we are. And I guess the first thing to say on behalf of the panel is we appreciate all the hard work that's been done. This is. Uh, uh, two, three years of uh, real slogging and uh, especially recognizing that uh, we have 9,000 units here considering what it was previously. Uh, just for comparison purposes, uh, apparently there's 6,000 units in the West Onlands. And uh, so this is a third more than that, which I totally support. The density is 7.7 .7 times coverage is pretty dense. Uh, the reality is you could find denser areas in the city, but uh, if you compare, um, you know, the railway lands or the, the, the Bathurst the key quadrant, um, you know, Bathurst and Lakeshore, et cetera, which was also built at seven times coverage. Uh, I, I think this is, this is a, it meets the density test and all of the members, I, I didn't hear anybody here say, you know, oh yeah, yeah make it more, add more, et cetera. So I think that's a, uh, we've accomplished a lot there. Uh, again, I want to iterate that, again, this discussion today was on bill form massing and the zoning. And so I'm going to try and keep my comments to those, those uh, themes. But the first overall point that I think is really important, and it relates to what Nina Marie said and several of us here, you got to make it unique, special, different. Look out the window. I mean, this is what people are going to live next. This is unbelievable. This is, you know, living on an island in a lake where the watershed meets the lake, et cetera. I mean, this has got to feel different than just another Toronto typical neighborhood. So I, I think that's that's the, the big idea, uh, if I can call it that. With respect uh, uh, um, to the 25-year build-up, this has to be a 21st century neighborhood from A to Z, thinking completely uh, in terms of built form, public realm, you know, pedestrian amenity, facilities, uh, you name it, everything. Uh, with respect to zoning, I think there's a number of things that have been mentioned here, but the overall theme was simplify the zoning. Uh, I couldn't agree more. As you all know, when I was at the city, it, the Kings, you know, uh, invented a new zoning bylaw just called regeneration area. And on the zoning map, all it said was RA. That's it, no density, nothing. I put heights, setbacks, RA. And you design as you work through. So I think I couldn't emphasize that enough to simplify the zoning. Some of the components of that about in no particular order, um, uh, consider, uh, perhaps more density on commissioners with a strong street wall. Look at the step backs. You don't need so many step backs. Um, do a lot of testing of the floor plates, figure out you know, what the various options are that might work and the servicing, all those kinds of things. Um, an, another uh, uh, comment uh, related to the actual zoning itself is the pink areas on the map is the best way I could describe it. Uh, there's been a general, I think, uh, consensus that, you know, yeah, th those areas should be even perhaps broader so that you can really, really tailor, you know, the, the applications when they come in to the specificity within those areas. Again, flexibility of built form is, is the overall theme there. The, um, 
uh, sec secondary related to uh, the blocks. Uh, well, I'll just go to the streets next. Uh, there has been commentary that maybe the streets are too wide. And, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But obviously, commissioners and Cherry need to accommodate streetcar. So uh, Chris's uh, presentation of the right of way and how it breaks down, you get a pretty good idea of how much space is devoted to the public versus the vehicular uh, lanes. And, and, I, and I understand that that rationale for that. But, but there's been many comments about the fine grain network that is needed. Uh, greater detail of mid-block connections, uh, east, west, north, south, uh, and to codify those, to think about them hard and put them into the zoning. So it's not something that, oh, well, it would have been nice, but we never got it. You know, they're there. We all know the, the mid-block connection in Yorkville from Cumberland to Yorkville, uh, uh, Market Square, going through the middle of, of the project to see the church, et cetera, et cetera. There's many examples throughout the city. Those are really, really important. And, and my experience is, especially in, in uh, Yorkville, if you don't codify them, you don't put them in there, you're, you're not going to get them, period because there'll be another reason, another rationale why, oh, well, you know, couldn't do it for a whole bunch of reasons. So I think that's a really important point. Um, in terms of breaking down the scale of the blocks now, think further about, there's been commentary that those blocks seem to be pretty big, especially the floor plate commentary. And, and think about uh, now in advance of how you might wanna break down those blocks e even further. Uh, with respect to um, uh, where are we here? the open space uh, overall, I, I think we've all agreed that it would be wonderful, especially over a 25 year period, to design some of these internal streets. So in fact, they could be totally converted to pedestrian use. And, and we've all seen examples of that. And I think that's not crazy. It's certainly very, very possible and very desirable. But you got to think about it in terms of how we do it, because once you once you have cars on a street, it's hard to get them off. So you know, there's lots of techniques you can you can uh, build in to uh, ensure that that transformation can take place pretty easy. Um, and, and, and you know, and I should maybe say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Is given the context of developers in Toronto, uh, no surprise, they want to maximize profit and they want to achieve their objectives and I, I couldn't agree more I think Betsy made the comment it's really sad and a problem that those internal two blocks called the outer scope blocks in the center are at OLT because you know you throw the dice uh, being very blunt about it the reality is you know if there's two towers there for 47 and 39 stories in the middle of this carefully thought out strategy uh blow the whole thing apart so um, i know how difficult that is to try and uh, rein that in but uh, i as assume city will be involved in the olt and they'll do whatever they can on that um, the importance of intertwining the public realm which is yet to come the public realm network the, the, the total network from east to west to north to south uh, and intertwining that uh, with the the uh, uh, massing in the bill for and the hierarchy of the public realm has been said many times. Very very important. I thought there was a great comment made about again to the um, through block connections, the water to water commentary. I think the Pina made. Um, you know, if it, it, on the east end, if you look at the green through block connection, what do you see? You don't see any water. You look north and you see a goddamn building. Uh, you know, these are like no brainers, you know, north, south, east, west, you know, again, look out the window. You, you want to see you're by water. You want to see water. So all those things are really, really important. And the final couple of comments, these are, just, again, themes in a suggestion, which I think would be very useful. Um, a suggestion was made to do a figure ground comparison of other Toronto neighborhoods, other Toronto districts, similar density, similar scale. Um, Oslo, of course, was mentioned as shown on the slides. And I think it would be useful because I think you'll, you'd see 
oh yeah, look look how this was accomplished here versus here, and it, it will give you ideas that can enrich this this uh, precinct plan in its present state. Um, and a final comment about energy and of course stormwater management, all yet to come. Kevin, uh, you always flag it. I appreciate that, but obviously we're we're in very early stages of that. But again, think of what the environmental standards would be 25 years down the road. You got to incorporate the future as best possible. So I hope that captures most of the comments that have been made here. Um, uh, I think in summary, um, it's, it's done a lot, a, lot, a lot of good work has been done. It's a, it's a good plan. It's a solid plan. It can always be made better. And all these suggestions here, I think, hopefully you can build in to uh, the next phase and we will be seeing you often. And we welcome you to come back with details and the public realm plan and how all these pieces will fit together. So uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, hope that covers most of the points. Um, so we need to take a vote. Uh, and based on what I have heard, I would suggest the conditional support would seem to be in order with the proviso that all these things we've discussed, we're going to look for them uh, as, as this comes forward. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure I'm quite at conditional, so I might want to okay. just ask the panel like. But we've asked for a lot, like a lot of this baking in of this porosity into the public realm, these through blocks. Um, is that something that we're seeing in the current plans as eminent? Like, will that come through? Will like I, I did ask for more density. I asked for um, and we asked for a lot more flexibility in the zoning envelopes, including like multiple people talked about eliminating the step backs and things. Conditional to me says that we see that as a potential for coming through um, in the next round. Uh, otherwise, it would be not support, and I'm happy to do it on my own. Um, there is one other option, yeah. um, which is uh, given the nature of our comments to defer uh, our decision uh, uh, on this uh, and um, have all these comments be recorded and go forward and with the understanding that when the public realm plan and all the details come back uh, that would be incorporated i don't we've never done that but i just since we're having this discussion let's let's have it i mean these weren't small things that we were mentioning even given and how appreciative we are of the complexity of developing zoning for a area like this like it's incredibly difficult can I just take a read on where the rest of the panel is? Yeah, no, I, thanks for raising it, Betsy. I mean, it's a delicate matter. So I, uh, I'm i in the hands of the committee here. How? Mm -hmm. Can I ask about deferrals? Because I'm sort of new to this. Um, I mean, it does seem more appropriate. Um, like Fadi, I, it is it is tough to, you know, resist talking about public realm and talking about the, this whole development holistically. and. Would a deferral also help in terms of actually in needing or requiring a certain um, direction and approach that is, you know. Jump in. Yeah, I'm please. not really sure about this. Well, I, 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 we usually <laughs> a new one support, <laughs> or we have full support, conditional or non-support. And listening to Betsy, um, of course, non-support is another option. There's no question about that at this stage. I, as I was listening, I just thought, well, is deferral an option? I, I think we should try to take a vote if we think we can. I mean, maybe take, see how many people vote for <coughs> conditional, how many vote for non if you want. Okay, so it sounds to me like there's, there's, we're not able to defer. Just, just for further well, clarification, yeah, please. I think yeah. that there is um, the, the realization that many of these items are baked into the plan, like we were talking about reduced GFA in order to ensure that we have that porosity. I think that what we were looking at was not to actually identify it. However, it should be in the documents in the in the um, precinct plan as a dotted line that we can understand then that there would be flexibility to achieve the porosity, but we're not going to dictate exactly where it is because this is a zoning envelope 
and it's not a building, it's not architecture, right? And again, with the the, the sort of illustration of the, the step backs, that is not building massing, that is an envelope, it's a zoning envelope. So you would never expect to see a building doing that, that is a, a zoning envelope his building to be within that volume, but not to be um, mimicking a zoning diagram. So these are all aspects of, of um, the plan that I think that we are, we have recognized and you have, you have um, uh, recognized are in the plan, but you need further detail. Um, I think, I believe, I believe. Uh, are we voting on massing and zoning? Yeah, yeah. That's it. Uh, okay. just, to, just a clarification. So, massing and zoning. Just a clarification from what Amelia I understood this was demonstration, not zoning envelope. That's where I'm a bit confused now. So it's it's <laughs> illustrating the zoning envelope, like the demonstration plans are illustrating the zoning envelope. Again, it's a diagram. It's a diagram mm -hmm. of a zoning envelope. But it's the step not back is testing, it's testing are in zoning. So if one wanted to build outside of the step back, you would have to go to you'd have to rezone it. And I think both that and I mean, I, and the, the GFA is also in the zoning, right? The GFA is in the zoning. Yeah. The, the lines on the map that illustrate the step backs you can build anywhere between inside those. You don't have to build, like if you're, if you're stepping back, you go, you go higher, right? You don't actually build the steps. That's just a way of illustrating the zoning. But you couldn't build say 10 stories if there's a step back at eight. So you would build eight and then yeah. you would build a box. Then you would build another box, well, right? I, I realize that, but if you want to build 10, you can't build 10. You have to do some gymnastic. Kind of yeah. Well, yeah, you would build your box and then you would build another box, but you wouldn't necessarily follow. Um, when is when is the project coming back for? Because I'm assuming it's coming back for some details and some uh, before. Very uncertain. So could be a while. Public realm, as I said, we don't even have funding to start design yet. So I don't can't say that that's coming anytime soon. It'd be great if it were, but I really don't know. Um, so, and so the zoning may not come back here. It, it doesn't have to unless there are big issues that get surfaced as it goes through the process. Yes, this would be the last. Well, I would say there's enough the things that we we've, we've seen today that would warrant it to come back to for us to comment. That would be my opinion. Yeah, we made numerous suggestions, right? So uh, uh, I'll just put it to. Okay. Can I can I ask a quick question? Sorry. Uh, so it's just like we can assume that the placement of the streets are set. Is there a way to assume that the mid block connections are they can they be seen as part of the public instead of the public realm like parks and others? Could they be seen as circulation the way streets and roads are being seen? Just another hierarchy of them. So, um, I, and in that sense, influence the placement of buildings, massing, setback. Or just for clarification, I'm just trying to understand how the mid blocks could potentially be seen as a form of public circulation network versus um, public realm in a second phase. So the uh, way that you can see the second phase is is looking at the public realm in its entirety, including mid block connections and pops. So looking at looking at the undesigned. Uh, park spaces, the waters at the promenade, uh, the design of the roads, and the way the zoning has been developed. We're showing the blocks in relation to the roads, but we're not actually dimensioning the road right of way. Yet. So there is some opportunity for some minor changes to those road right of ways and where they're located. So there might be some changes for that. And the mid-block connections, though, is part of, and as well as um, the courtyards and other pop spaces, all of that is something that would be explored when we're looking at public realm in its entirety. So, that But provides... that doesn't in any way influence the zoning envelope then? If like the alignment of the road changes or if there's a new connection that goes through a new block, just I'm, I'm, it's all, all it's just for clarification. I'm trying to understand how those two things go hand in hand. Zoning both or they don't evolve. 
Yeah, the zoning envelopes is very, very, very broad, and you can know how that is actually broken up. That's something that really is going to be directed through our work in public realm and the next phase of our updates to the reason. So this is a um, think of it as just amassing that we're bringing forward with the envelope and how that's carved up and and how buildings are going to be designed within those envelopes. That's part of future work. Okay, we got to uh, move on here. Can so, just clarify, yeah. um, well, non a couple of questions. Side. Yeah. Yeah. So, con uh, conditional that's does not side. imply that they would come back, but non-support implies that it would have to come back. Okay, oh, non-support yeah. for sure. It would come back. Conditional, given all the comments we made, we would want to see it come back with, you know, the public realm plan, et cetera, et cetera, and how it all fits together. But as it Chris has said, it's uncertain when that would happen. And we're trying to get to planning and housing in June um, for the zoning. So that that is our timeline right now. Very tight. Very tight. However, it gives us the flexibility, like the way that, that the zoning has, has been thought out, it gives us the flexibility because it, it's a, an envelope. However, we've carved out the elements that we think are really important. Um, so we can continue, like we had carved out areas that uh, allowed for a sort of water to water view on some of those blocks. There's the opportunity to do that on the remainder of them, right? There's There's those kinds of things. Um, but the the goal was to get to zoning in June for planning and housing. All right. Any other questions? It's a bit of a dilemma, uh, the, the way it's come forward. So I mean, we're going to have another chance. When people start designing this oh, realm, yeah. we're going to be looking at it anyway. Right? So this is really about massing and, and zoning. Massing and zoning. Yeah. I know. Which is... And it's it's pretty flexible, but we want it to be better. Yeah. Which is the condition of the support. Yeah. So I don't know. Just take the vote. Uh, who's in favor of conditional? Raise your hand. Two, three, four. Okay. In favor of non-support. Two. Okay. Thank you very much. Six. What about my online? Oh my God. No. My back was turned, my apologies. Uh, Bridget and Fanny, conditional or non-support? We can't hear you, Bridget. Conditional. Conditional? Right. Okay. OK, thank you very much. I apologize for this taking so long, but it's a delicate matter and it's really important. So we will see it again for sure. OK.